Uh, welcome everybody to this session on inclusive learning. Um, so the structure of this session is we've got four talks and they're 10 minutes each and we'll just go one after the other and then at the end we've got 10 minutes for questions. So if you enter your questions through the app, um, they'll come on the iPad here. Um, or if you're struggling to use the app or if you want to use the microphone, um, what's your name, sorry? Jill will, can help you with that. Okay, so uh, we'll start with uh, Joe Billington, a PhD researcher from the University of Reading. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about um, my latest study, the last study of my PhD, which is a qualitative investigation into the lived experiences of autistic children in mainstream primary schools. Um, the rationale of this study is based in the fact that we, we know that autistic children can have a difficult school experience and impoverished educational outcomes. We know that they are, compared to non-autistic children, much more likely to be excluded and experience social isolation. We know that they are much more likely to be bullied and experience academic underachievement. We know that they're more likely to experience mental health difficulties, and there's a small and recent but growing literature around children, autistic children who find school so intolerable that they can no longer attend. But the challenge for me was when I was reading this literature, and it is extensive, I struggled to identify the child's voice in that literature. And that's because historically research in this, this area has privileged the voices of parents, carers, teachers, ally professionals. Relatively few papers in comparison have actually engaged with the subjective experience of what does it mean to be autistic in a mainstream setting. And those that have have tended to focus on the secondary school years or those children and or those children who have access to the highest level of support or specialist resources. So in England, that specialist report, support is known as an education health and care plan. And around 2% of children across the whole school population have education, health and care plans, and that rises to around 25% of autistic children. But that means that 75% of autistic children in the mainstream school system in England do not meet the criteria for an education, health and care plan, but you don't see that reflected in the research literature. So my study design was to explore what does it mean to be autistic in a mainstream primary school if you don't have access to an education, health and care plan or specialist resources of any kind. And if you do experience challenges in that experience, how, what strategies do you have to overcome them? So I conducted um, a study with 10 participants, five girls, five boys, who were in years five and six of mainstream primary schools, so around nine to 11 years old. And I used an IPA methodology to conduct a detailed examination of how the participants experienced everyday school life and how they made sense of those experiences. I conducted online interviews because this was in the post-COVID, um, immediate post-COVID um, period. Um, and that was supported by photo elicitation and written accounts. Most of the participants spoke to me, but two chose to type and also submitted written accounts of their everyday experiences for me. I've also used poetic transcription, which is a method by which poems are created from the transcript data so that I can again use another method that amplifies the voice of these children. And I'm gonna hopefully have time to share some of those with you today. So anyone who's done IPA will know that um, it's huge. So condensing the results of this study into a 10 minute talk is quite a challenge. So I'm just gonna focus on the three core themes. So the first one was that the children described enduring a hostile sensory environment. That was the kind of central aspect of their everyday experience. Loud people and places were particularly sources of anguish for them. And we're talking about pain and intense hostility that they experience from those uh, loud people and places. So teachers who shout, for example, were regularly cited as, as causing pain. 
Also spaces where there was a multi-sensory uh, kind of overwhelm. So those were places like the lunch hall, for example, and the school playground. Now, interestingly, in their descriptions of those, these are also places that are typically associated with fun and freedom. But for these particular pupils, it wasn't like that at all. These places were not places where they felt free. In fact, they felt much more constrained. Also, there was the kind of low-level but constant um, discomfort of a school uniform that wasn't necessarily person or space specific. As a result of that overwhelm, craving withdrawal and retreat was really an, an important feature in their data. So having places to go to when they needed to step back was really important. And I'd love to talk to you more about that because these children had wonderfully creative ways of finding these spaces. But actually, for the most part, it was stressful and effortful to try and get access to retreat. But also, aloneness could be experienced negatively as well, because like the broader data and the broader literature, bullying, shunning, and social exclusion was very much part of their everyday life. And this is where the vital importance of guardians came into effect. So these were peers and teachers who provided a kind of translation of the neuronormative um, kind of systems within the school, but also a certain amount of protection from maybe the sharper edges of that too. So maybe one or two very special friends who they'd known for a long time, but also teachers. The class teacher was a key attachment figure, a key person of safety for them. So thinking about how to represent um, their words in a talk like this. I'm going to show you some of the poems that I've created from their transcript data to illustrate these key three themes. If I can get it to move. There we go. So this is the first one. Um, enduring a hostile sensory environment. I just want to recognize before I read these out that I understand that me speaking on behalf of my participants is problematic, but I hope that you'll understand that I'm doing this because of time constraints rather than anything else. So this is a, uh, a poem that has been constructed from the words of the transcripts from the four children mentioned here who are, whose names are anonymized. She shouted a lot, hurt my ears, huddled in a corner crying, Loud chatter washing over me, like a gosh ding dan tidal wave. It can be a little scary. One loud word is going around in my head. I told them to stop knocking or stamping. This giant cacophony echoes in my head, distracts me. It gets on your nerves. It's not a very good feeling. And then the second theme of aloneness. Like I said, aloneness was something that was forced in some situations by perhaps exclusionary practices and certainly people who perhaps had a hostile um, attitudes towards the children. But sometimes it was also chosen and craved and something that was really wanted. The poem here is about the former rather than the latter. I'd rather not go outside at break and lunch. I try and think of something I can do to stay inside. My friends are always playing things like tag and I don't like that sort of playing. I just stand there doing nothing, nothing on my own. It's quite bad. And then the final theme, the vital importance of trusted guardians. Again, teachers were really prominent in the data but this poem relates to peers, trusted friends. He really, like, looks out for me, plays with me when I'm upset. He's always there. He's really kind. We go way, way back, like way, 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 way back. We're the bestest of best friends. He makes me feel a lot better. He helps me calm. He will listen to what I say and understands me. I find it really hard to go to school when he's not there. I worry that there won't be people there to play with. So in terms of the conclusions, throughout the data, and there is a mountain of data, um, stress, fatigue, and masking were really prominent throughout. 
And whilst there isn't really a lot of research about autistic burnout in young children, these all align with findings about autistic burnout in adults. There's a strong connection between those two things. And again, this is qualitative research, so it can't you know, provide that association, but there's something interesting in that, I think. And again, teachers appear to be a key safety figure. So it wasn't just about the academics. The teachers were important gatekeepers in terms of the children's sense of self, their sense of worth, and their sense of belonging. So the role of the teacher was so much more than a facilitator of learning. It was essentially somebody who helped them develop their sense of identity. But this created a kind of high stakes environment because these children needed to keep their teacher happy. They needed to make sure that they were on the right side of their teacher. This relationship was so important that they couldn't possibly be seen as anything other than a model pupil. And actually what these data suggests is that adaptations to increased sensory comfort and greater understanding and acceptance of autism in schools may be more effective in terms of these children's well-being than perhaps any within-child interventions that might be given to them. And most importantly, these novel findings reflect the fact that these children's voices for this particular population, who are a majority in our mainstream schools, is just not reflected in the literature to date. So we need to be doing more to amplify the voices of young autistic children. Thank you for listening. Great. Thanks, Joe. Okay, so next we have uh, Charlotte Butter, who is a research assistant from the University of Manchester, and Katie Baldwin, who's a speech and language therapist. Hi, so um, we're going to be talking to you about creating some supportive social groups for neurodivergent high school students, um, and the training package that we're developing called Haven, which is Hearing, Accepting and Valuing Every Neurotype. Uh, so I'm Charlotte Butter, I'm a research assistant at the University of Manchester in the Social Development Research Group. And I'm Katie Baldwin, I'm a specialist speech and language therapist based in the Social Communication Pathway within CAMS in Manchester. Um, so we'll give you a bit of a background to our project and then we're going to talk about the interviews that we carried out with young people for the development of the training. Um, then we'll dis uh, discuss delivering the Haven training to the school staff and how we plan to assess the impact of this training package. Our role as speech and language therapists in the social communication pathway often involves supporting autistic young, children, young people, their families and schools. One common theme that um, young people and their parents often ask for help with is how to support their young people or themselves um, with having positive and meaningful friendships. Traditional speech and language therapy interventions focus on teaching and shaping social communication towards neurotypical norms and we would often train schools to use these approaches to run social skills groups, which doesn't sit right with me anymore. <laughs> um, there's limited evidence of the effectiveness of these traditional approaches, and clinically we found that people were often resistant to engage, they never really seemed to get a lot from them, um, and schools were quite insist uh, inconsistent with their approaches. Um, and we knew it didn't really fit the need of the young people that we were seeing, and we wanted to try something different. So, we, oh wait, go back. <laughs> so from talking to teaching staff, um, they had observed that within some of the groups that they were running, um, it was actually just being in the environment for the young people to be in that, those environments that was important and appeared more important than the actual activities that they were doing. So this drove us towards a collaborative project with the University of Manchester, along with my other speech and language therapy colleagues um, and educational psychologists, um, for us to pull together to have a think about how we could develop a new type of intervention um, which would offer opportunities for neurodiverse young people in secondary school settings. We moved away from thinking about how to directly change behaviour or teach social skills. We reviewed some of the literature, um, and this has been echoed across the conference over the last two days about how um, environments where people feel accepted and understood and safe to be themselves led to in increase in confidence and successful communication. And we really wanted to try and um, replicate this within um, a, a group environment within high schools. So we pulled together some ideas to train school staff, and the training was um, available for teaching assistants, teachers, um, pastoral support, anyone in schools really, um, 
and the groups, instead of being social skills focused, we wanted them to be um, interest led. So with activities that were chosen by the students based on their interests. And to get this right, we were keen to gather information from young people, um, from neurodivergent young people, to find about what, out about what their high school experiences had been like. What support had they had? Did they like it? What did, would they have wanted that would, might have been different? And also their feedback about our ideas for a training package in schools. And yeah. Yeah, so we interviewed 15 neurodivergent young people to find out what they would find useful in a club in school. And they're all aged 16 to 24, and most of the interviews were over Zoom, and some completed them in written form as well. Um, so we asked them about their experience of high school, any clubs they attended, what they liked and disliked about the clubs, and whether they received any support with making friends. Um, and then we asked them about their opinions on our proposed training package. Um, so we had a range of recruitment channels, as we can see. Um, and then we carried out a thematic analysis on their responses. So one of the most common themes that came up, um, reported by 40% of the participants, was a preference for quieter environments and smaller groups. So in response to what one participant said they didn't like about a club, they said, yeah, it was really busy and really loud. Um, and then someone else said, I also find it a lot easier to talk to people when I'm not with a group of people, but preferably one or two people. Um, another common theme that came up was that there were different preferences for support with friendships. Um, so one participant said that they would prefer laid back environments where everyone is neurodivergent. They thought that that would encourage better communication. Um, however, one participant described being introduced to another autistic student um, by a teacher, and she said some of the things that they were into was a bit odd to me. So she was saying that just because we're both autistic, it doesn't mean that we're going to have the same interests, we might not have anything in common. Um, so the point to take from it was that not all neurodivergent individuals want support with friendships, and so we can't try and force these. Um, and then 33% of participants also reported these um, themes, so joining clubs out of interest for the topic um, rather than because friends were in the club, um, it was mainly just because of their hobbies. Um, there was this idea of communication barriers, so it was reported that some of the participants struggled with understanding subtle messages um, and misinterpreting what other people were saying. Um, and then there was this sense of togetherness in the clubs that they, they attended, uh, they felt accepted, they felt a sense of belonging. Um, so then we asked them about their opinions on our proposed training plan, and 40% of the participants said that it was good to hear from autistic people in the training to give a real-life account. Um, so one participant said, I think having neurodivergent people involved in writing, presenting, and any other part of the training process possible would be really good. Um, so here we've got a short video from one of our participants, George, who's consented to share this video here. I don't want to be forced to make a friend. I want to be able to find one myself. I think what makes it easier for me, and probably others, is um, I want to feel that whatever it is, that I'm in an environment where I feel safe. And I think if you pair an environment where someone feels safe with something that they're actually interested in, you will inevitably find people that have similar interests that you will want to speak to. So there, he's just highlighting that we can't try and force these friendships, it needs to happen naturally. And we use that video clip within the training package for schools as well. So um, how did the interviews inform the training package? So we, the interviews gave, gave us a deeper understanding of people's experiences and values, which informed our focus and directions in terms of what people wanted, what people might be motivated by, and what might help people to feel safe and secure in the environment. Feedback about sensory, um, the sensory environment was really important as it can make or break whether people can focus or feel relaxed or even get through the door and then want to come back. So there's a very strong message that if you get these things right, then people will be more likely to be motivated, feel more confident and relaxed um, and interested in uh, developing social connections. It was important that the facilitator both understands and values differences in interactions and communication, but also um, has the skills to support situations where people might benefit from some, some gentle support with those things. So bridging understanding, 
kind of interpreting messages like uh, we, we mentioned on the slide before. Um, and this is a clip of one of our participants who, um, again, which is included in the training, which just out, outlines what she thinks the role of the facilitator could be. So, yeah, I feel like they should play a part in it, just helping autistic students overcome that fear of starting a conversation with someone, because it's not easy for the student to do it themselves. So I feel like teachers should play a massive role in that, just helping them go up to somebody, have a conversation with them and just get to know them, really. So, yeah. And within the training, we do have quite a strong focus on trying to work through different scenarios where if people... Um, understand and accept those differences and not all it's not always just about helping people to talk to each other but it's about accepting that actually sometimes just being quiet and being with somebody is a positive experience so where are we now um, we've piloted the training package to um, some schools in manchester in october and november last year and we're now rolling the program out with some regular training sessions booked um, between now and the end of term um, for open opened up to all high schools across manchester now We've had some really positive feedback um, so far, both from the training sessions and from the groups that have started in schools. It's just a really early stage of, um, of rolling it out, really. Um, but the reports from the, the facilitators are that students are asking to come back week after week, asking if they can keep the sessions going once from kind of after they've finished. Um, and some of the observations that they've made is that they've seen, as the sessions have progressed, they've seen increased confidence and communication between the students. I've also found out this week that we've also been rolling it out um, with some of the primary school settings, the higher end of the primary school settings, so year fives and sixes. And we've had really similar feedback in terms of observations of young people appearing to um, seem more relaxed and confident and, and communicating more with each other. And we're now at a stage where we're thinking about how we can start evaluating the training session. Um, so we are planning to do some questionnaires with the students that attend the new groups at school, both pre and post the block of groups. Um, and then we'll also carry out an interview with the students at the end of the groups to find out about their qualitative experience of attending. Um, we'll be doing some interviews with teachers to find out how they found delivering these new groups. And we're going to carry out some group observations with a couple of researchers sitting in on some of the groups. And all of this will help us to assess the impact of the um, Haven training package. Um, so yeah, thank you. And thank you as well to our other researchers and clinicians, Alison, Katie, um, Sophie and Alex, um, who will help to make it possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next we'll have um, Professor Alison Lane from La Trobe New University, and she's going to talk about designing sensory spaces to improve school access, participation, and achievement of neurodivergent students, an interdisciplinary approach. So thank you. After those two talks, all of a sudden this talk sounds quite relevant. <laughs> and so I hope to not disappoint. I don't have data to present to you today, but I do have the, the beginnings of a, a framework that's um, come about through an interdisciplinary uh, collaboration, um, which I will explain. So um, between myself and um, Arif, who are both occupational therapists, Graham, who is a built environment construction manager, management expert, perception scientist, psychologist, Katie Unwin, and architect, um, Andre Pamana. So this is the, the, the I guess, the, 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 uh, what I'm presenting to you today is on behalf of this, um, this team. Um, just some de declarations before I get started. I'm a neurotypical clinician researcher. My background is occupational therapy. Um, there's some of my funding um, declarations there that are relevant to some of the information that I'll give you today. So firstly, what are sensory differences? I, I probably don't need to explain those too much for you as an audience. Um, it's certainly come up a number of times over the last day and a half. But the point that I do want to make um, relating to sensory differences are they're, they're observable behaviours um, or responses to daily st sensory stimuli that are unusual or don't meet the demands of the environmental conditions. And 
Um, in saying this, there aren't any truly absolute sensory behaviours, if you like, or sensory differences. And by that, what I mean is that context is really important. important. So a sensory um, behaviour in one context might not be um, a concern. It may not be functionally, um, uh, or may not prevent um, participation in that particular functional context, but in another context, it may be problematic. Um, so in general, understanding that sensory differences are um, unique to individuals, but also to context, and that's an important um, point to make within um, when thinking about managing sensory differences. Um, this is a, a, a newer article from Murray and colleagues um, based on a phenomenological study exploring um, autistic and non-autistic experiences. And one of the themes that emerged from that study was this concept of sensorium, which I think is an important one to consider when thinking about engagement with env environments, and this is particularly from an, an autistic experience. And this notion of sensorium being the totality of our subjective sensory experience and processing of the world, and the noting that particularly with an autistic experience, the sensorium is central. It's central to how life is experienced, how um, it's essential to conditions for trust in the environment, both the social and the physical environments. And it can be uh, consist of acute, intense experiences, which are both positive and negative. So I think this notion of sensorium really, really very clearly captures the, the importance of the centrality of, of the sensory environment as um, part of daily living. So in terms of strategies to address sensory differences, you know, as we've heard, there, there are you know, obviously a number of um, approaches. Some of those uh, have been focused traditionally within um, uh, trying to address or change the sensory responding pattern of the individual, but others have been focused more on changing the sensory environment, and that's, I think, an essence of what you're hearing more about, particularly in the last um, day or so, about the in in sense of creating environments that are accessible from a sensory perspective. And so that's what I'll focus a little bit on in this talk. Um, what does the evidence say? So the evidence, I should say, uh, you know, is sparse at this point um, in that particularly this notion of dedicated sensory environments within school settings. Um, you know, there's a little bit out there, but you know, there's not a lot. But in general, what is reported so far is that where there are dedicated sensory spaces, that they do support positive outcomes um, for students. And I think some of those themes came through in the two talks that you've, you've heard so far in this session. But at positive outcomes including calming, including positive sensory stimulation, support for learning and academic readiness, reducing distractions, uh, teaching transferable skills, enjoyment, leisure, positive relationship development, learning assessment, and reduced levels of disruptive repetitive behaviours. And there's also some evidence within the... Just sorry, I had to see a typo on my... You never see that until you're presenting it, right? Well, being, that should say, not welling. <laughs> um, Sorry, some general support within the, the, the general literature around the built environment that you know, the built environment may contribute to quality of life, inclusion and well-being, particularly in autistic people, through this notion of reducing sensory burden, um, et cetera, and that, that there's that potential for the built environment being a particularly powerful way of promoting inclusion. Um, because of its adaptability, but also because of its power in, in addressing a number of things. Um, the other thing to note is that there are these recently released ex um, guidelines um, from the British Standards Institution um, called Designing for the Mind, Neurodiversity in the Built Environment. Some of you may know about these. Um, 
But what I wanted to highlight here, and this is a direct quote on this, from those guidelines on this slide, is really the positioning of providing um, good sensory inclusive environments as a way of providing a number of environmental, economic and social advantages. So not just, you know, as a remediatory, if you like, or um, accommodation, but actually something that makes good sense, good design sense. So, you know, the attraction of new customers, for example, in, um, enhanced retention of employees and customers, reduced absence, um, enhanced well-being, improved performance, um, positive communication and providing a more empowered and um, environment where people are feeling more in control. So I think that's an, an interesting addition to, to this discussion around um, creating these sensory in environments. So what I want to turn to now is a focus more on dedicated sensory spaces rather than um, a generic um, sensory environments. And as those of you who work in schools will know that sensory spaces are a common, a, a popular um, um, idea um, and, and implemented um, with good intent, but not always with great execution. And so what we as our interdisciplinary team what put our heads together to think about well, what are some of the, I guess, critical elements that might need to go into thinking about designing those sensory spaces to hopefully improve the effectiveness of those. So this is where we're at, interested in your feedback and I'll walk you through this um, um, process. But essentially what we're proposing that is that in designing sensory spaces, we really want to consider these three interrelated elements being about considering the function of the sensory space, the specific design parameters, and then the solution type. Um, and that the, and I'll walk through each of these in turn. But the, the key here is that you're looking for, um, as my colleague Graham talks about, a satisficing solution, so something that is both satisfactory and sufficient to the need. So let me walk you through some of the functions of sensory spaces as we understand from our um, engagement in the school sector, but also the literature. Firstly, about escape, and we've heard some examples about that in the talks already today. Um, that is a space that offers temporary respite, allows an autistic person to calm down prior to return to activities. A stimulate space, where you're actually looking to provide sensory stimulation, a learning space, and then a leisure space. There are a number of design parameters that need to be considered. The application, so how is this space going to be used and when? Student voice is critical. There are a number of physical design um, features to consider and then obviously the delivery aspect. There's some design detail here, which I'm looking at the clock winding down and I'm not going to get to this, but I'm happy to talk about it more. There are a number of areas to think about here within the design of the context, the scale, what activities are going to happen within that sensory space, whether it be controlled, there's control or no control, are they structured, is it individual led or adult led? just right challenge being key, but construction elements around material, safety, injury, prevention, hygiene, maintenance, and cost. And then solution types to be thinking about that sometimes it doesn't need to be a brand new shiny thing that's a new build. Sometimes it can be a repurposed space. Sometimes it can be a space that exists, like the cupboard that um, Holly was talking about yesterday in her, her talk. Um, and so I guess in conclusion that sensory differences are a key driver of well-being. The sensory environment may be an efficient and powerful means of improving well-being. Our research evidence is, is um, starting to emerge but is, is not definitive. So we propose an interdisciplinary approach, inclusion of student voice, clear identification of the function, thinking through those design parameters and the solution type with a focus on a satisficing outcome. So thank you. Great, thank you. And lastly, we'll have Hiba Aljay Uzi, um, and she's a PhD researcher at UCL, and also assistant head teacher at Mayflower Primary School. 
and she's going to talk about evaluating the use of flexible seating in a mainstream primary school for neurodivergent and neurotypical children. All right, thank you very much everybody for staying for the last part of this talk. So um, I'm gonna take off the PhD uh, student hat today. So today I'm just a teacher and assistant head at this wonderful school, which is Mayflower Primary School, but I am biased as it's the school where I'm the assistant head and I lead inclusion there. So this was a really, really fun collaborative project for us to do because it was a big project to involve the whole school community alongside the wonderful Cray team who helped us with the academic side of things. And we were funded by the Churchill Fellowship. So basically the way it worked is that I wrote an email to the lovely Dr. Laura Crane and I said, if I get the money to buy this furniture, can you help us do something academic? And she said, yes. So that, that's what we did. So a bit about our school, um, because the context is important. So our school is a two-form entry mainstream primary. It's in the East End of London, uh, not Shoreditch, proper East End, like call the midwife East End is East End. And at the time of the study, we had, uh, the data is there for the number of children we had on the special needs register. The neurodivergent children were of high proportion and we had an estimated 26 pupils with a diagnosis of autism. The reason that's an estimate and not factual is because the waiting lists are now up to three years in Tower Hamlets where we are. So some of the children had diagnoses and the others were on the pathway maybe one year into the wait or two years in. And um, a bit you need to know about our school is that it's a very creative school. So uh, we use the creative curriculum and the arts and a lot of visuals everywhere. Uh, we're quite flexible on the uniform, we don't stream, so there's no such thing as ability grouping. So we are used to working in a very flexible way, and perhaps that's the reason why we see some of the data that we saw. So as a teacher, I'm going to say to you that um, teachers in general, when we train to be teachers, uh, we're trained in a way that makes us obsess about good sitting. So at the time I made these slides and I put good sitting into Google, I got 243 million hits, which I couldn't go through. I hope you understand. But the commonly associated things were cross your legs, don't slump, don't lean forwards. And um, I don't know whether you're familiar with um, the raging behaviorists that we have now that are running the country. I won't mention any names, but like think the social mobilities are and there's a behavior advisor for the DFE. You can look them up. They're obsessed with this good sitting and track the speaker. And the most recent uh, thing that I've seen now is slant. So you, uh, you must slant forwards and look at who's speaking and track them all over the room and pay attention. So good sitting gives many uh, teachers nightmares uh, the night before they're going to be observed. And sometimes when you're training to be a teacher, you can obsess and, and like draw a seating plan and try to like, I don't know frankly why they train us to be dictators in this way, because it doesn't work. So um, the reason that we were thinking about flexible seating was um, really for to apply a universal design for learning and to meet the needs of more children in a more holistic way in the school. So we already um, were very fortunate to work with a great occupational therapist and she recommended some flexible seating approaches for some pupils. Uh, we didn't really like that being for some. It, it didn't fit with our ethos and we, we didn't like that it made some pupils stand out. We didn't like having this rogue seat in the classroom. It didn't fit with the Mayflower way of doing things. And we tried to get an extension to our build, but the local authority quoted us six million pounds, so we couldn't do it. But I don't know if you were in um, the talk before where Peter Warmby was speaking and, and Elliot and Fergus, and it is true what they say, that what you have to do is try and make best endeavors, uh, be a bit flexible and move in the right direction, no matter how small your steps. So we just thought, well, okay, we, we can't knock down our walls and, and move rooms around, but maybe we can try and get these seats for everybody in a way that doesn't stigmatize certain children and a way that lends itself to choice and motivation and flexibility. 
And the real question was, um, we were wondering whether using these seats would benefit everyone and how we would evaluate this. And hence, this is where Cray really, really helped us. And there is the team there on the third row on the right. And I have to give particular kudos to um, Aaron and Taylor, who did so much of the work for us. And this idea I first saw of flexible seating being used in the New York Nest Schools. So I really must acknowledge them in helping us see that this was possible as a whole class setting and not just for particular children. There's an extensive team that helped us with this research. Uh, and we had neurodivergent as well as neurotypical people on the team. And last but certainly not least, there was all the children and all the staff at Mayflower Primary School who really, really joined in this very enthusiastically, especially the children who really um, steered this. We had a chair committee at the school. And if any of you are teachers, you will know that when you tell children they have a job, you've got a job. So, so the previous um, literature showed that any data that was gathered about the use of flexible seating, it tended to be teacher perspectives only. There's a real problem with that because it disregards all our wonderful teaching assistants who are 50% of our workforce. They, fo they focused on one specific kind of chair, so it might be the wobble cushion or it might be a ball chair, and they focused um, mainly on neurodivergent children in a very targeted small way. So it might be, does a rocking chair help children with ADHD or an autistic child or a child with dyslexia? So this was the first study that we're aware of where we introduced the seats to everybody, whole school, everyone from ages three to 11 in the school. And we put in these different chairs with the advice of our occupational therapists in our classrooms. So I'll quickly go through them. Um, if you don't mind, otherwise I'll run late. So these are all the different chairs that we tried. Uh, these are generic names, but there are, there are different brands that you can buy from different providers. And we put these into our classrooms. And the rule was very simple uh, for the teachers. We had a staff tracker and we said, look, don't hide these, don't restrict their use, just go loose. So it was our, our way of teaching anyway was pretty fluid. So we just said, put them in, let's see what happens. And we introduced them in September. They were not a novelty to the children. They had seen them before used, but not on a large scale. And we promised them that when we did the evaluation in March, whatever they told us they loved is what we would get more of. So they were very much in control. So in March, we uh, evaluated the project. So we did a survey with the children and it was a mixed um, quantitative and qualitative data that we gathered. And we also surveyed the staff. And there are the lovely Aaron and Taylor who came in and helped me. So it took us about four days and we surveyed um, 348 participants in total. That was 315 children. Uh, ages four to 11 in compulsory schooling, 258 of those were neurotypical and 57 neurodivergent, and they were a mixture of autistic children, dyslexic children, uh, children uh, with DLD, dyspraxia, diagnosed and on the pathway, and 33 staff. That's wrong. That doesn't add up to 33. I think it's meant to be 14 teaching assistants. You see, that's what happens when you are. So, we then um, see, we got, drew out the codes from the pupil responses to why is this your favorite chair and why is it your least favorite chair? So we asked them which one was their favorite and their least and why. And teams were developed from the codes and you will see there that the things that mattered to children um, and not just what behaviors ours will tell you that if you let them sit how they like, they're gonna wreak havoc, that fake news. So fun did come out, but as you can see, it's not in bold. So fun is not their biggest attractor. So in fact, the thing that they, was very important to them when selecting a chair was concentration. They were talking about chairs that helped them complete their tasks. They spoke a lot about productivity, about movement, so, and it was very clear that they needed to move. 
in lessons. They made that abundantly clear to us and also comfort. So this was what the children thought. Well, these were their favorite chairs. So the rocking chair and then the wobble stool. So the chairs that they rated the highest were the ones that lent their self to movement. And they universally, I guess 25% is kind of, it's very, yeah, they universally condemned across the year groups this chair, which was the straddle desk. I don't know why they hated it so much, you know? I even bought a cushion to go on top, but there you go. And there were very small differences, really, in the opinions of neurotypical and neurodivergent children on certain chairs, which showed us that actually what we, are, what we kind of hypothesized was true. This was a good adaptation for everybody, not just neurodivergent children, with the exception of the rocking chair, where 10.7% of children on the special needs register um, viewed it negatively, as opposed to half that number of neurotypical children, which makes us think, well, maybe the movement and the sensory aspect of those chairs is a different, but there is more analysis taking place. So Erin uh, is doing that. So we will have a paper soon with all the data crunch in detail. So the things that mattered most to the children when selecting a chair, they were not thinking this chair is fun, I can spin around. There were some great isolated quotes. Some children said to us, if you turn this chair upside down, it's a great marble run. And some children said to me, I'm gonna rock anyway. Do you want me to have an accident or are you gonna buy me a chair? <laughs> All right, go to the head teacher now and tell her. So the things that mattered to them were in selecting a chair, does it help me concentrate? Is it gonna allow me movement in a way that's not, not gonna get me into any sort of trouble? And is it comfortable? You know, they're not daft, you know. The government treats, treats these kids like, you know, they, they, are, they must be controlled to this. this is so, I don't know why these people are not in the army, why they're in telling us what to do. So with the staff survey, we had 33 participants. And again, it was a combination of qualitative and quantitative questions, somewhat based on previous research and others we developed. And there was also um, an impact of inclusion questionnaire that measured the teacher's attitudes towards inclusion of children with additional needs. And in our school, as you can imagine, that was, it, it was quite high. So the teachers in general did have a, a good attitude towards inclusive learning. And the staff perspectives were overwhelmingly positive. So over 90% of our staff would recommend flexible seating to other schools. And as a cross school strategy, which means for all ages, don't be scared of putting them in with the youngest children. It's totally fine. And um, again, their thoughts on flexible seating were largely positive as you can see from the data here. And like the children, we are delighted that they also chose the rocking chair and the wobble stool as the best seats. So, and most of the teachers said we would have these chairs back, they're good. The majority would opt to have all the other options with the exception of, I'm sorry, that's very small, the floor rocker and then this ball chair. I know why with the ball chair, because if you turn it upside down, it's a space hopper. It's also very, it's also very large and it, and it didn't fit under the desk and actually the children popped too with pencils just for fun. So um, I can understand how that would cause havoc in a classroom. We didn't keep them because the children said they didn't want them. I didn't care about the teachers. The children said no more, so that, that's what we did. So that the vast majority of staff, we're very happy to report, um, did say that the flexible seating did not prove difficult to adjust their teaching to. It didn't make managing behavior in the classroom any more challenging. So if there's anything going on in the classroom, that is causing any sort of you know, altercations between the children, it really isn't the seats. And this obsession about not providing this as an adaptation, I think is misplaced. It did make teaching and supporting the children easier and it led to improved pupil engagement, behavior and comfort. And most importantly, when you give children choice, they are more motivated to learn. The more you try to control them, the worse things get. And exactly what Fergus was saying this morning in his talk earlier, the best way I think to be an inclusive school is to just be a bit more flexible. If you have a rigid curriculum 
and a rigid looking classroom where there's no flexibility, your job as a teacher is much more harder, you're by default a less inclusive school, and, and to what ends? I, I would love to see the behavior people who control to the nth degree show me some data like this, because they can't. <laughs> And the negative views amongst about flexible seating need to be acknowledged. They, they are very minimal, and that data is still being analyzed. But from what we can see, there, there's some you know, um, reasons that are given include distractibility of the teachers themselves by the seats, and practical factors such as transition between lessons or preparing lessons. But bear in mind that the level of experience amongst our staff is quite broad at the time we did this study. So hopefully when Aaron um, does a bit more work on this, we'll be able to attribute this, are these the early career teachers? Who's saying this? A and try to help, you know, look at that in more detail. So in conclusion, we hope that we have convincingly showed that um, flexible seating as a whole school approach is overwhelmingly positive, not just for neurodivergent, but for all pupils. And we do suggest that using it is a feasible way for many schools to meet the needs of more children. It's relatively, I don't like to talk so much about, because ethically it's the right thing to do. We don't have the intake of pupils that we had 20 years ago, so why are we teaching? And why do we have furniture that we had 20 years ago? It's the ethical thing to do, but also it is very cost effective. 50% of our um, furniture in the school is now of flexible seating, and that cost us less than 25,000 pounds. It's feasible, it's ethical, it makes teaching and learning fun, it hands over control to the pupils, and you don't need to knock down through your walls to do it. So thank you very much to listen, for listening, and yes, I think I'm on time. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Right, okay, so um, if anybody needs to go to the poster session, can I ask you just go now so that we don't interrupt the uh, questions? Um, right, so thank you so much to all the speakers. I just, I love research like this so much. I think these are, these projects all have the potential to have high impact, so um, that's great. So, um, right, so uh, we have a question for Joe. Um, can you give us a sense of the creative comfort places through retreat that children cultivated? Um, yeah, the toilet was a, <laughs> a, a very important place and actually a, a, a place of great stress as well because um, the choir of a toilet stall could only be found in class time and there was a lot of stress around using it to go to the toilet during break times. And I know that this is a hot topic at the moment anyway, but yeah, the comfort of a, a, a quiet stall where there is no one else in the toilet was really important. And actually that the restorative impact of that could just be a couple of minutes, one or two minutes of quiet in the toilet stall was, was really important. For other children, they were really creative. So they would find places to retreat to. So one of my participants talked about there was a climbing frame, um, like a pirate ship in the playground. But if you, there was one board that was a bit wobbly and if you moved that out of the way, then you could get into this really dark corner and she would sit there and she would just enjoy the sound of everyone around her, but she had this dark, quiet space where she was alone in this, you know, the hectic uh, playground. But then also, um, retreat sometimes took the form of breaking the rules if the rules didn't work. So there was one boy who would like to go into the garden, and the, he called the garden the secret garden. Um, and it was only accessible when you were with a member of staff. But he routinely would break the rules about going to the garden, even though he was punished for it, but because it was just such a quiet, lovely place to be. So there was lots of ways in which they were creative, but also ways in which they could get into trouble. But it was necessary for him him to do that to to get access to that space yeah, that's great and um, so for Katie and Charlotte um, how has the project been received by teachers and school and staff in schools really positively actually we were a bit worried um, or we, we weren't sure how it was going to be received but um, a lot of the feedback has been astoundingly positive and um, they really got the idea of um, your diversity and acceptance and differences in communication and interactions and um, it's yeah it's been really well received. Great. Um, so for Hiva, um, 
was uh, wondering about conflicting access needs and whether the use of some chairs by some children was distracting for other children. Um, no, I, I don't think that they, they really were. We also did an activity with years five and six, which was if you were the head teacher for a day, how would you design the classroom if you had unlimited budget? And in fact, they were incredibly considerate. So mo they were saying they would put the standing desks at the back of the class so that other children could see. So if there were these things, they were really very minimal. But, at, but as I say, the children in our school are used to working in this very fluid way. So they don't have a seating plan. Nobody sits next to anyone else. There's no ability streaming in the school. So actually, my, this is anecdotal, but it's because I'm in the school every day with all the children. We didn't have anything like that reported where they, they were all pretty considerate of each other's needs and the needs for different people can have different things. They're quite accustomed to learning in that way, so we didn't have much of that that I saw anyway. Great. Um, so, Alison, um, what considerations have been made to ensure that sensory spaces are used in a beneficial way instead of maybe a disciplinary way? Um, I think that's one of the, the challenges for um, sensory spaces and the design of them, to be honest. Um, so that's where it's important to really understand the purpose um, and the function of a sensory space. And yeah, um, there are a lot of tripwires in this whole process of, of designing and using sensory spaces. And, and one of those tripwires to navigate is is ensuring that everybody you know, within that learning environment is on the same page in terms of how that um, sensory space is to be used and and um, what needs it's um, going to best you know, meet. So um, the, I don't think a, a, a disciplinary um, aspect is ever an appropriate function for a sensory space. So yeah. that wasn't in my list. <laughs> and um, but it's it's about having that conversation, as I said, from an interdisciplinary perspective about the purpose, and then making sure the needs um, are identified um, such that the use of the space, well, one, it gets used, but also it doesn't get abandoned because it's not actually meeting the needs. Um, so there's one uh, last question here that I'm going to put to everybody. Um, how to help teachers and parents understand that inclusion and flexibility won't lead to chaos, especially if that has perhaps in the case, been the case in the past? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. We, um, so the groups that we, when we've done training in the past for teaching um, in schools, what a lot of the feedback has always been is that we really like to have a package of with, with activities where we can follow it and a quite a structured approach, whereas this approach is very much led by the young people. And we weren't sure um, how, how that would, was gonna go really. And I think that just by them doing it, I think they've, they've reported that the first session is always a little bit chaotic, but then it very quickly becomes something really, um, just really, um, natural I think is, is the way the, the way that they're describing it and just by doing one or two sessions they're convinced that, that it's the right approach so I think it's just go and have a go is what we is what we're trying to say yeah does anyone else want to say anything to that question um I think from the research that I've done in the three studies that I've done I, I, I don't know if I could say anything that would improve on that but what I would say is that the alternative so not providing flexibility and not being led uh, and treating children as autonomous agentic individuals is really harmful so it's almost like we don't there isn't an alternative not changing is not an option yeah I have one I have one more small thing to add is um there is sometimes the assumption that flexibility means chaos, and it's the complete opposite. So for you to be a flexible and inclusive school, you actually have to plan very carefully. I don't know if you're familiar, anybody with teaching in the early years, that's always called an organized chaos. There's seven areas of learning that have to be uh, 
you know, set up indoors and outdoors simultaneously. I wouldn't call it chaos, I'd call it organized chaos. And it actually does take a lot of planning. And I think most parents, when they see that their children's needs are met, I don't think they're, they're, they're too conflicted about how those needs are met. Yes. So I think the outputs and the results usually speak for themselves and they alleviate any doubt to the way you're doing things. Yeah, really nicely said. Okay, so we'll wrap up there. Thanks you very much to the speakers and um, enjoy the poster section and the rest of the day.